did. And uh, let me double check something. I didn't get the verbal. This meeting is being recorded. Notice. So let me make sure my speakers are working. Ah, much better. All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we'll start with some quiz questions and we'll go through the quiz itself. And so you guys can um, figure out uh, if anybody or where you had issues. And we'll go from there. Um, so I feel like we're going at a decent pace because roughly half the questions were about the material and half the questions were about uh, um, random stuff, which usually is a good indicator to me that you guys don't have too many questions about the material or that we're, we're pushing it at about the right pace. Um, so random questions, what's the deal with keto diets? Uh, keto diets, the same thing as the Atkins diet, basically. Um, people might disagree with me on, on that but it's basically just a low carb diet um, that uh, limits the amount of energy you take in from carbohydrates, whether that is um, in the form of starches like breads or rice or in the form of sugars. Um, that's where what our body is designed to get most of its energy from. Our body is designed to get to use protein and fat mostly as supplementary uh, energy sources. And, and that's why our body runs on glucose. So if you cut glucose and other sugars out of your diet, what happens is your body has to start getting the energy somewhere else. Um, and it's not as efficient. Short term, your body is pretty good at taking fats and converting it to energy in the absence of glucose. But long term, um, if you've heard the term ketosis from somebody who follows a, a keto diet, that's basically what happens is if you don't have any carbs in your body and you're trying to break down fats all the time, um, your body starts making ketones, um, which are as sort of a byproduct of digesting fatty acid chains. And that's not particularly healthy because those ketone bodies um, are small ketones like acetone, for instance. Um, and ac acetone is not particularly healthy for you. It's a carcinogen. Um, and if you, if you talk to somebody or know somebody who's really strict about being on a no carb diet, um, you can actually smell acetone on their breath if they've been in ketosis for, for a long period of time. Um, so it's, it's good for weight loss. It's not good for long-term health. Um, unless you have some underlying health condition, um, for instance, um, epilepsy or um, diabetes, in certain cases, it can be advantageous to stick to those really, really low carb diets. Um, and so the combination, what is it that makes us prone to storing fat? It's not that eating carbs and fats and protein all together makes you prone to storing fat. That's just eating too much storing fat is just your body's way of putting putting aside energy for a rainy day um so if you if you eat too much too many calories your body will always take those excess calories and turn it into uh, into fat if you don't eat any carbs with those calories though it, that that limits the amount that you can actually do that because your body's spending so much of its own energy trying to convert fat into ATP in a method that's not as efficient as um, converting glucose to ATP. In fact, usually your brain has, to, or especially in your brain, but in the rest of the body too, your body actually has to take, take fat and convert it to glucose. Um, in order for your brain to continue functioning. So if you just don't give your brain glucose, your body has to make glucose in order for it, your brain to continue functioning. 
Um, and so if you just don't give your body glucose, then that, that means it's less likely to store fat. And plus you tend to eat less calories if you are not eating zero carbs than if you are um, eating carbohydrates mixed in. Um, and so it's more about just limiting the total amount of calories um, will keep you from storing fat rather than cutting out any one particular part of your diet. Sean, actually, I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, I've heard that um, in why ketosis is kind of better is because you get more ATP per molecule of fat or something like that. Do you know why that is? Or Well, so in if you're trying to lose weight, you actually want to be generating less ATP per fat molecule because then your body needs to burn more fat molecules um, in order to get the same amount of ATP to keep your body running the way it's supposed to. Um, so it depends on who you're talking to. If there's somebody who's you know, a, a fitness expert or if it's somebody trying to lose weight, you're going to have opposite viewpoints on that. Um, yeah, it was for more for uh, longer lasting energy. Like if you if you treat your teach your body to run off fat, you 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 get more energy out of per fat molecule than you do per sugar molecule. That's what I've do, heard. But, but you get you get less ATP per carbon. Mm, so you're okay because, That's because your fatty acid your fatty acid chains are like sixteen to twenty carbons long, versus a glucose is only six carbons. So you do gotcha. get more energy per molecule. And I, and I believe that, and I haven't taught biochem in a while, so I might get this backwards, but I, and I believe that fats store more energy per gram as well. Um, but they are not as, not as efficient in terms of the energy per carbon. Um, but if you do get your body into, you know, fat burning mode, as it's from a fitness point of view and having long-term energy, you want to have like the bare minimum of carbs to prevent you from going into ketosis. Um, because that'll keep, that keeps your body's metabolism working well, because the reason you go into ketosis is because your body is breaking down so many fatty acids that it doesn't have a place to put all these ketones that get generated. If you have just a little bit of carbs with that, your body has processes that allow it to get rid of those ketones as well. So in general, ketosis is not a very healthy place to be. Um, it's just better than being extremely overweight. Um, and it's okay short term. But if you're if you're you know a professional athlete, you don't want to be in ketosis. Um, because you're you're basically running on your body's secondary energy system as opposed to its primary energy system. Yeah, it's kind of scary when you talk about the brain needing glucose too. Yeah, well, so the brain has to run on glucose because the, your brain is all fatty tissue. And so your brain does not have the ability to break down fats because if it did, you would be digesting neurons every time you got hungry, every time your blood sugar got low. And so, in, so your liver's primary, one of your liver's primary jobs is to regulate your blood glucose levels so that your brain continues to get glucose even when you're hungry. Um, and so that's why fasting can be really hard on your liver because basically your liver has to take in all these fats, convert them to glucose to keep, keep your blood sugar levels at a, at a reasonable concentration so that your brain doesn't starve. Um, which is the other reason why you can wind up spending more energy and why you can wind up losing weight in, in ketosis is because you're working your liver harder than normal. Um, good questions though. I, like I said though, it's been a while since I taught uh, biochem. So it's um, oh, a little bit rusty, but I think I got that right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Why is it so hard to make fresh drinking water? Um, so it's not really a synthesis because there's water everywhere, right? It's more of a purification issue um, in most of the world. And that's part of the reason that it's such a big deal is that there are a lot of different environmental toxins that you can be exposed to if you're drinking unpurified water. 
Um, if you want to purify water, you got to remove all cells and viruses. Um, sure. Yes, actually, I should be screen sharing probably. Um, so you got to remove all cells and viruses, otherwise you're going to wind up with cholera or dysentery. You've got to remove all heavy metals. You've got to remove salt because otherwise that throws off the osmotic pressure of your cells and your cells wind up dying. Um, you don't want to poison yourself with heavy metals. Any Most other organic materials that are in water are going to be poisonous to you on some level and your body's standard response to any sort of toxin it doesn't know what to do with is to flush it out by giving you the runs. Um, which leaves you more dehydrated than you started. So there, there are a variety of different reasons why we need to clean our drinking water. Um, and distillation and reverse osmosis take care of all of those issues, but they're both very energy intense processes. You have to put a lot of energy, which means money, in to get the water purified. And both um, distillation and reverse osmosis take um, specialized equipment and you have to have the knowledge of how to do it properly. Um, so, you know, if all you're worried about is the cells, if you're not worried about the heavy metals and the organic material, you can just boil water and that'll take care of it. But that's not going to remove heavy metals and that's not going to remove other organic material and it's not going to remove salt. So basically all that does is prevent you from getting cholera and dysentery, which is big, but it's not the only thing you're worried about. So lots of other methods, the, the number one method for getting rid of those other concerns is distillation um, because, it's, because it's easier to design a still than it is to design a reverse osmosis filter. But both of them require a whole lot of energy to do it, um, which either means time or money or both. So it's more of an economic concern how do we how do we get clean drinking water to the rest to the low income parts of the world in a way that's sustainable that you're not that the company trying to do this or the government is not going to be bankrupted um, in the process. So it's it's almost it's not a science problem. It's an engineering problem and it's a it's a political and economic problem. Um, you know, if the engineers if we had clean if we had uh, sustainable fusion reactors electricity would be so cheap we could just build desalinization plants all over the world and anywhere that had access to salt water to ocean front would be able to have virtually unlimited drinking water um but with the energy cost the way it is now that's not really viable we don't even do that in the u.s for the most part right i think there's a desalinization plant in san diego um that provides a bunch of energy or a bunch of drinking water down there. But for the most part, it's not even economically viable in the US where we have lots of technology and money and need lots of water. Is it in, is it, if I'm remembering right, Elke, it's in between San Diego and uh, in Orange County, somewhere around Camp Pendleton or something like that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> I hate it. Well, actually, I'm not sure. Maybe that's not the one I went to, but um, it's like there's a big salt, like water vat. Um, it's it's on the outskirts, but it's I I didn't like it. My mom works for the state for the Department of Water Resources, so she deals with all the grants and stuff that has to go with water desalination. So. Yeah, and, and in places like San Diego, it can be still a good idea to have a desalinization plant because there's so many people and so little natural drinkable water. Mm -hmm. um, but usually if there's a better option than desalinization, we're going to use it um, be, unless we come up with a way to make electricity so cheap that it becomes viable. Yeah. Um, do, yeah. You know, do you know why certain districts have, um, they have like, stakes on like water sources like the Hetch Hetchy is for San Francisco. Do you know what the deal is with that? So a lot of it has to do with historical like treaties and things like that. For instance, the um I think it was the part of the water rights to the Colorado River reverted back to being controlled by Mexico after a hundred year long treaty. The the US controlled 
all of the water rights for the Colorado River for 100 years, and that just ran out in the last five years or something like that. And now we're only allowed to use a certain percentage of the Colorado um, River's um, water flow. So there, there, a lot of it has to do more with um, agreements with local mun municipalities, like San Francisco has an agreement with, say, Marin County um, over who gets control over X amount of water, for instance. Um, and some of it's due to private landowners and different states even have different laws regarding um, water resources, especially. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, you guys may have noticed that all of the California beaches are free to go to um, but on Nevada, most of most of the shoreline on Lake Tahoe is privately owned. It's not most of it. All of the natural forest is still natural forest, national forest. I mean, um, but like the the beaches in Nevada, they can charge you to have access to the beach, and they can't do that in California. Um, that's because in by state law, all beachfront in California is is state park. Um, so you might you can't trespass to get to the beach, but the beach is is public property in everywhere on the coast, on lakes in in California and other states. That's not the case. So water rights are very very complicated. That's why you can get a PhD in environmental policy because fighting with different water municipalities is a very big deal. Mm -hmm. Emily. Yeah. Well, then how can they like um. So it's like Lakeside Beach, I think it is. Um, they like there's like just a gate between the beach and the road, and they charge you to go through the gate, but only the gate. So that's that's Lakes. That's on Nevada, right? It's in Nevada. Okay, that makes sense. Because I thought that was in California, but it's like right there. So I believe that's that's on the other side of state line. Um, but if but if you look at like Tahoe Beach Retreat, those um, you know over by um, Promesa in the CVS, over by Glazed and Confused. Um, like that's, there's a bunch of resorts right there, right? But they can't stop you from just walking up to the beach. They don't charge you for it either. They can charge you to park. They can charge you for, you know, to have access to drinking water when you're on the beach, but they can't stop you from just going to the beach. They have to provide public access to the beach. Um, there might be a few places that are grandfathered in along the shore there because there are some fences up. Um, but there's, again, that's got all going to be based on the, the when that law came into effect and if it's still the same property owner um, from when before that law, then a lot of times laws have grandfather clauses where if you're, you know, you can keep things the way they are as long as you're the one who owns the property still. But as soon as you sell it, then you have to conform to um, these new laws. But, and again, that's, that's a whole can of worms when it comes to, like, that's why environmental policy is its own major. You can get a degree in environmental policy, a PhD in environmental policy. You can be a lawyer specializing in environmental policy because all of those things are so interwoven. Who has rights to the water? Who has rights to access? Um, it is very complicated stuff. All right. Um, and I also thought before we get into more OCAM related stuff, um, someone asked about The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which is a fantastic book about a very bad situation if you haven't heard of Henrietta Lacks. Um, she was a, a woman, a black woman from the early uh, mid 1900s. Um, correct me on the timeline if if I'm wrong, Stephanie. I'm just going off of memory here. Um, who uh, who had cancer and her her cancer cells were actually culture, cultured and are able to be grown in labs in more or less a continuous way. That's the thing about cancer cells, right? Is that they're constantly replicating. Um, and so they actually found a way to take Henrietta Lacks's cancer cells and cultivate them in a lab for research purposes so that they have human cancer cells that they can test various treatments on. Um, but they did it without any sort of permission from Henrietta. Um, and it, it led to a, um, a very long, long period of time um, where 
Henrietta Lacks's genetic material and and cells were being used without her permission um, to and all over the world. Almost any any um, bio biotech lab that works on cancer research uses HeLa cells. Is what they're is how they're known. Um, so it's a it was a very big issue that was never really fully explored. And I believe at this point, her, her family might be getting compensated to some extent, or at least they've been, no, they've just been recognized as it being a, a problem. Um, but those cells are still used worldwide. Um, I have not used HeLa cells myself, but that's mainly because I've never worked in a lab that worked on cancer treatment or actually never worked in a lab that actually had live cells in it. Um, otherwise, I'd, I'm sure I would have needed to use them at some point. Um, so it's, uh, I highly recommend that book. Um, and it, it uh, is one of those things that science has done in the past in the name in the name of science that is really really not a particularly good or admirable part of science history um but it's worth shining light on to um make sure things like that don't continue to happen in the sciences i actually um <clears throat> reading about this a few months ago and i've i've read that like the issue was that they labeled it with her name. If they hadn't done that, it's fair game. So if you get COVID and you go donate blood two months later and you have the antibodies for it, they can take your antibodies and make it into a vaccine without your consent as long as they don't label it with your name. So that actually can still happen today in medical science. They made the issue by labeling it with her name, but like that still happens today. I, I, and again, I, it's, it's, I'm just going off of memory here. Um, it, they likely so now we have these user and user license agreements just like with with when you install a program you have to agree to this contract that says that's that your data can be used and by using facebook you're giving facebook permission to sell your information um by using a company's vaccine or a company's treatment you are giving them permission to use part of your genetic material um and i believe a a big chunk of it is that her cells in particular are somewhat proprietary in the sense that they can't get other people's cancer cells to grow the same way. Um, and so if there was something about your particular antibodies that were unique, then I think that that, that has its own set of legal ramifications. Um, but yeah, in general, they're, they'll, you're allowing them to do some amount of research um, as long as it's not something that's specific to you, if it's if your antibodies are the same as everybody else's antibodies and they're experimenting with everybody's antibodies, um, then you have no rights to it. But if there's something specific about you and they're cloning your cells, that is has its own um, set of of legal because technically you are the copyright holder to your genetic information, right? So if you there's something that is unique about your genetic code that makes it so they have to have yours in order to do their research that is and that's one of the legal issues with henrietta Lacks is that her cells are the only ones that they could get to grow like this originally so they couldn't just stop using hela cells and use somebody else's cells um but again i i'm getting into the legal side of things which i don't have a lot of experience with and i have not finished that book. Um, so I don't know exactly how it all shook out in the end. I'm just going off of uh, um, the first part and Wikipedia mostly. And that was a long time ago at that. So take that with a big grain of salt. Um, going to go these last two out of order because there was a, if you were going to the jungle to study alkaloid content of random plants, how would you go about identifying what's present and in what concentrations? Well, this is a good question for, um, for uh, us because separating, purifying, and figuring out what you have is a huge part of 90% um, of OCHEM lab. And 
there actually was a movie about this exact situation um, starring Sean Connery in the early uh, in the early 90s where he has let's see if I can get a better picture um, Sean Connery with a ponytail um, very uh, very early the rock um, where uh, it's about a scientist who goes into I thought my my ochem teacher presented this as being a true story. I found out when I was reading up on it last night is not in fact the true story, but you could do this. Um, basically, if you take a GC with you into the jungle, you can just start, you do a liquid extraction with a nonpolar solvent you, with um, about any plant you want, feed it into a GC and you're gonna get back a bunch of peaks to say, you've got a compound that came out at this time that has this type of, um, and that's present in this concentration, et cetera. So you can basically use, just use a GC to split everything up into its pieces. And these days we actually have GCs that are automatically feed into a mass spec or into a, an IR. So GCMS stands for, is gas chromatograph mass spectrometry where you just have them linked so that every peak that comes out of the GC is automatically taken, a mass spec is taken of it. And from the mass spec, um, and you can figure out exactly what the structure is. So basically finding what compounds are present in these in random plants is actually really, really easy now if you have access to a GCMS. Um, it's a bit almost complete, you can almost totally automate it and just wind up with um, computer feeding you back, okay, well, these are the compounds and then these, this is the mole fraction of each of these compounds in this plant. Um, the problem is you have to get the plant samples and you have to be able to cult if you want to turn it into something you could actually make um, in a lab you need not just to know what it is but also have the precursors or have a natural source of that compound um, so you it's not just enough to go into the amazon and collect seventeen thousand different leaves you have to know what plant they came from. You also have to be able to continue to grow those leaves if you want to make it in any sort of economical way. Um, these days, organic synthesis is, is uh, to the point where we're not usually using plant-based leads very much anymore. We've kind of exhausted most of those. and We're kind of going at our totally synthetic route when it comes to drug discovery. Um, because we already know what most of the psychoactive compounds in the Amazon are for the most part. There's probably some in there we don't know, but we we have a good enough idea how drugs work that and how poisons work for that matter, that we don't necessarily need an organic or a, a plant-based source of a molecule to be able to make it and test it in a lab. Last but not least, since we're talking about epoxies, um, what is actually happening when you have an epoxy that cures? Ring opening reaction, exact thing that we were working with with epoxies last week. Um, if you have an epoxide and you expose it to something um, that will let it go through a ring opening reaction, you can wind up with basically a bunch of small monomers reacting together to make one big molecule. And so a lot of times your monomers might look something like um, they might have two different um, functional groups. So for instance, if we had, had an epoxide on one end of a molecule and then had an alcohol on the other end of the molecule, well, alcohol can act as a nucleophile. The epoxide can act as a target for a nucleophile. So if you had another molecule down here, you can wind up with, and actually it's going to go to the less sterically hindered side, right? You can wind up with a ring opening reaction that then is leaves this as another good nucleophile, right? And it can go and it can cause another ring opening reaction or um, can grab a proton from an alcohol molecule from a molecule next 
neck nearby and you wind up with basically all of these molecules wind up getting linked together and so what you're when an epoxy is curing you're basically letting the entire thing turn into one big molecule and then waiting for any water that's generated to evaporate out um and so that's why a epoxies once you set them you can't just reheat them up or dissolve them in acetone to reset them when an epoxy forms it forms to that shape and once it's done curing it doesn't change the shape because you actually have to break covalent bonds to get it to form a different shape it's not just a phase change um so and it's very relevant because we're dealing with it with epoxides and ring opening reactions it's just a ring opening reaction in a very controlled way that creates this this polymerization. All right, now on to quiz questions. If you also are interested in um, other pop culture. Um, pop culture science references um, of gas chromatographs. It's a very, very small, you know, narrow niche of things to be interested in. Um, but if you do happen to be interested in that, um, Morgan Freeman in Batman Begins is using a GC in one of the scenes. He's like in the midst of, of injecting a sample into a GC when something comes on, uh, when some headline comes on about Bruce Wayne. Um, but it was the exact same GC that we had in my lab when Batman Begin came out. Batman Begins came out. Um, and so that was funny to us because uh, we know that machine. Um, it's always funny to, when stuff like that shows up in big movies. Then he actually is using a real piece of equipment, not just some made up thing. All right. Um, in general, you guys did pretty well on the quiz. Um, you guys got the name for each compound pretty well. A few people mixed up R and S and a few people, um, probably the main thing I want to stress with these epoxides is that B is not methyl propane. It's a butane because it, the longest continuous carbon chain is four carbons long. Um, and let me get my tablet logged on so I can draw on this. Um, so where your, where your ether is attached does not have to be carbon one. It just, you just want to find the longest, oh, I stopped screen sharing to draw, didn't I? Thank you. Um, you just want to find the longest continuous carbon chain that has the epoxide on it, not that starts with the epoxide. Right, so that leaves it so that get the uh, my tablet up. Um, so that means that these four in a row, it's butane, it's ethoxybutane, not, um, not methyl propane, ethoxymethyl propane, right? It, it can be, there we go. There's our butane, Adam. Yeah, Sean, does the ethoxy follow the alphabetical organization rule? Like, say, would you put that before methyl, or do you want to keep it as part of the, like, main function? You would group? put that before methyl. Okay. And and then actually before ethyl even, too. Ethoxy and then ethyl, um, be, because we would want to keep it as the entire thing alphabetical as much as possible. But again, if there's a dye involved, that throws everything off and books can't agree on stuff like that. So um, don't get too worried about that. But ideally, yes, you would put the ethoxy before the methyl. Um, and then for, for instance, for A, um, I wasn't picky. 
um, about what you called one and what you called two, as long as you were consistent yourself. And they are both um, S, I believe. And the, remember the ones where the hydrogen is already into the board are the easier ones to figure out because you just have to assign your priority, which is going to be one, two, three, and four is already into the board. So we don't need to rotate anything. So when we draw our arrow one to two to three, it's counterclockwise, which means S. And for the one, for the top stereo center, we have priority one is the ethoxy group, priority two is the direction um, that has the methyl, and three is the direction away from the methyl. And our fourth priority is pointed towards us. So if we just draw our arrow one to two to three, that would be going clockwise, but we have the hydrogen pointing towards us. And to get our priority right, we need the hydrogen facing away from us. So you can either just do it like this and remember that if the hydrogen is pointing towards us, it's going to be backward. Or if you think about it, if you, if you start drawing a circle that goes clockwise, and then you turn and you look at it from the other side, it switches from clockwise to counterclockwise. Right, it's a little bit like like um, patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. It's hard to keep your finger going the same direction and rotate your head around it. Um, but that's why we wind up flipping. If it if we draw the arrow clockwise, but the hydrogen is pointing towards us, that means from the other side, we would be drawing our arrow the opposite direction. So it would be um, so they both be S. And so it'd be something like one, one S, two S, one ethoxy, two methane, methyl cyclohexane. And then um, I sprung the thiol on you without telling you ahead of time, but I figured open book, you guys could look ahead a few pages in the textbook um, to figure out how to name this. And it's named just like an alcohol, except instead of just ending in OL, it ends in T-H-I-O-L. So, and then usually for these, we, we leave the E. I don't know why they do that. It's not hexanthiol, it's hexanthiol. Um, and I don't know exactly why they decided to do it that way. Um, but that's commonly the way you will see it written. So either, you can either write it as hexane three thiol or three hexane thiol. Um, if, you, if you got rid of the E, I didn't mark anybody down on that because everybody in the real world would still know exactly what you're talking about if you didn't have the E in there. Um, and then we would also want to specify R versus S. This looks like it's going to be S. One, two, three. And the hydrogen's already facing away from us into the board. Um, you guys, most of you got question two correct. Uh, the trickiest thing about this, actually the most common thing that you guys messed up on was that, that uh, a number of you lost a carbon on part one, um, where you, so the, the ethoxy group is gonna come in here and attach to that carbon, ring opening reaction, then we'll protonate. Um, and so you wind up with OH, phenyl, ethyl. And then a number of you just drew this straight to an oxygen for the ethyl or for the ethoxy group. 
which means you lost a carbon in there because there was another carbon that then you attached the ethoxy to. Oops. So it should have looked like that. Um, beyond that, it seems like you guys all got the hang of when we do these ring opening reactions, you're putting your new substituent on the less substituted carbon, the, the less sterically hindered carbon. But for whatever reason, despite the fact everybody did it right on question two, um, almost everybody got it wrong on question three on the uh, mechanism one. Almost everybody put the bromine. Hey, Sean, I actually have a question about that. Yeah. In the book, it has that if there's a tertiary next to a um, secondary or singular, it has it attaching to the tertiary with acid catalyzed reactions. Okay. So that's why everybody had it the other way. Um, Probably. So I'll double check that. And it could just be acid catalyzed goes, goes the opposite of base of a base catalyzed ring opening reaction yeah, that, and that's what it seems okay. like um, Except it's it's weird it's like yeah they say if there's a primary go with the primary but if it's secondary versus tertiary go with the tertiary so, okay or you yeah or even primary so, there, there's always ter tertiary is always better for some reason i think it's uh, electrical sterics of when the oh breaks off it creates a uh tertiary carbocation i think so it, it doesn't make a full tertiary carbocation, but it makes, but the transition state is going to look closer to a tertiary carbocation. Um, it's the same as when we had that, the triangular intermediates with, with the bromination where we had, had this bromonium ion we always wound up putting the second bromine came in attached to the um, the more substituted carbon because that the intermediate where you start with with this bond breaking is going to have some carbocation character to it. So I will I will go back and add half a point to everybody for that um, for that one, and I will get clarification on that, and we will talk about that on. Um, on Thursday. And really, we actually have something that uh, will, it's it's something that's going to be a very, very, it's not as cut and dried as it always goes to one or the other. It's going to give you a mixture of the two possibilities. Um, and in particular, where is this one? Um, this is for a different reaction, but the logic applies. You can have what's called a kinetically favored versus thermodynamically favored product, where you can just by changing the temperature, you can get it to favor one product versus the other. Um, because if one of them has a higher barrier, but, but is more favored by thermodynamics, you can wind up favoring one product versus the other just by changing temperature. And so my guess is that that's what we're seeing here as well. They just hadn't covered the idea of thermo thermodynamic control versus kinetic control. So they hadn't talked about it in those terms yet. Um, so I will, I will uh, give you guys clarification on that on, on Thursday. Um, and we will talk about it a little bit in lab today. <clears throat> um, so let's make, check on the chat here. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and go through a few pages of thiols because there's not that much to cover when it comes to thiols because we've already covered ethers and, and um, alcohols and thiols are just are more of the same basically. Um, they do have a different name as well. Sometimes they're known as a mercapto group. Um, and that's basically, but that's that's sort of old school. And it's only if you need to name it, if you have two functional groups that should both be named 
with a suffix, for instance, an alcohol and a thiol. Normally, we, if we were trying to name this, we would be naming both of them with a prefix, but so or with a suffix. And so if you have that, what you usually do, the approach is to turn one of them into a prefix. So we could name this molecule either as a mercapto alcohol, or you could also name it as a hydroxy thiol. The prefix for an alcohol group is hydroxy, because it's like you added a hydroxide ion um, to something. And so anytime you, you have two functional groups that we would normally name with both of them with a um, suffix, you can turn one of them into a prefix. Um, and John, uh, yes. sorry, just a quick question. Um, oh, if you could go back to that slide. Um, so we're capitalizing methyl and mercopto. Um, is that always the case? No. So chemical compounds are not proper nouns. Mm -hmm. And so you only capitalize them if they're at the beginning of a sentence. In this case, they are. In this case, it's written that way, yes. Okay. Um, I usually go out of my way to make sure that they're all written lowercase so that you don't wind up with that issue. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, yeah, that, that is a common pet peeve of chemists everywhere, chemists who all who pay attention to grammar, which is actually a fairly small subset of chemists. Um, but yes, they are, they are not proper nouns, so they should only be capitalized at the beginning of a sentence. Okay. Although even that has a gray area when you start considering things, molecules that are named after people. Buckminster Fuller is the guy who invented the geodesic dome. And there are, there's a chemical compound that looks like a geodesic dome that's named after Buckminster Fuller called fullerene. So if fuller is a proper noun and should be capitalized like a name, is fullerene a proper noun? And should that be capitalized as a name? And again, that we get into a gray area and something that doesn't matter to 90% of the chemists out there. Um, these mercaptin, these thiols are, that are also called mercaptins, um, they're called mercaptins because they form very strong bonds with mercury. So they literally capture mercury, mercaptin. Um, that's where that term mer mercap a mercapto group. Um, and actually, that's what if the anybody is uh, into geology, um, cinnabar is a common mineral that you find around here. That's actually mercury sulfide, and it's really really stable and hard to do anything with that mineral um, because mercury and sulfide form such a strong bond to each other. Um, anybody, anybody in here know um, Chris Fabry and Matt Mims, those guys before your time, probably? I think Matt Mims is still around. Um, uh, he, so Matt Mims and Chris Fabry for their research project in Chem 103 actually got Scott Valentine to give them, give them a good sample of cinnabar. And we dissolved it in aqua regia and then reduced the mercury to make metallic mercury um, in lab from cinnabar, which was kind of cool. Be able to take a rock and turn it into metallic mercury in a lab. Um, and they got decent results with it. I was actually pretty surprised. And we got to make aqua regia, which is that acid that is so strong it can dissolve metallic gold. Um, it's called aqua regia. Regia is for, for it means king in Latin. Aqua regia is the king water, is the king solvent, basically, because anything will dissolve in it. Um, but anyway, well, we'll go, I'll tell you one story about aqua regia, and then we'll, and then we'll uh, pick up after break. Um, aqua regia, like I mentioned, will dissolve gold. Um, and so during, when um, the Nazis invaded Poland in the beginning of World War II, there was a lab um, where the, the one of the chemists had a Nobel Prize on the wall, um, and he had to he had to leave Poland so quickly because he was Jewish that he didn't have time to go to his lab and get his Nobel Prize, and so his um, his coworkers 
took his Nobel Prize off the wall, um, dissolved it in aqua regia because Nobel Prizes are made of solid gold. Um, they dissolved it in aqua regia, labeled it properly, you know, gold in aqua regia, put it in the stock room in the, in the acid cabinet and left it there for the whole war so that the Nazis didn't find it and melt it down um, to make gold bullion with it. Uh, and then at the end of, the, of World War II, when, when he came back, his co-workers took that, that bottle and precipitated the gold back out of the aqua regia by neutralizing the acid. And they were actually able to re recover the exact same gold atoms that his original metal were made from. And the Nobel Prize Committee recast his Nobel Prize for him with the same atoms that he had to begin with, which I always think that that's a really, really cool story about aqua regia. All right, let's go ahead and take our 10 minute break and we will spend more time on OCHEM when we come back um, at, uh, let's come back at nine.
Nice haircut, man. Looking pretty sharp. <laughs> Thanks. I have to I have to be in uh, interviews next week, um, so I needed uh, needed to clean it up a little bit. Nice. You can help the college pick up some new uh, people. Yeah, we're doing. We're heal, hiring uh, a couple um, a couple faculty this quarter. We're hiring a new English full timer and a um, and a new biochem instructor. Somebody who who could teach uh, molecular bio or, or sorry microbio or um, in the chemistry department since we don't have anybody who's a full timer in the biology department who's comfortable teaching microbio since that's sort of its own beast compared to ANP or environmental science. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna be filling that position this this quarter sometime. So, and that means I get to be involved and be a committee chair and and uh, be involved in that process. So that's that's kind of fun. I will have to be less exhausted and struggling to find people that can fill in all the extra units that we have after this quarter. Cool, man. Is that because you got your tenure that you get to sit on the board like that? No, they they're always looking for volunteers um, that, uh, you know, it's, it takes a fair bit of time. You know, it took me eight hours last week just to review the applications to see, um, and then, uh, then to go through a meeting where we discuss who gets an interview basically. And so, and then there's, it's going to be two days of that. I have to give up of eight hours each day, basically of uh, interviews. Um, so it's, it's not a, usually they have trouble finding people to volunteer to be on hiring committees because it is a big time commitment. Um, so it's not, uh, not something that I had to elbow people out of the way to get on the, <laughs> on the hiring committee, especially when, if it's related to your, your department, they usually will you know, make sure that you get, if you want to be involved, that you can be. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ah, uh, it's, I'm helping myself because like I said, I'm, I'm tired of teaching 22 units every fall and spring. Um, I just noticed the buckyballs comment. Yes, buckyballs um, are, is the informal name of the fullerenes. So A fullerene is the official name, um, but they're also known as buckyballs. Actually, C C sixty is actually named after Buckminster Fuller's entire name. It's Buckminster Fullerene. The class of molecules that have this overall shape um, are called are called uh, fullerenes, plural, like alcohols, um, or buckyballs. Um, and it does look like Wikipedia, at least, seems to go with the don't capitalize molecule names because they have buckyballs as being lowercase, not uppercase. Good to know. I figured, but you never, never know. Uh, interestingly enough, Fullerenes are one of the first cases of nanotechnology, and they're still figuring out exactly what we can do with them, and just like carbon nanotubes. Anyway, let's go back to thiols. Um, and I guess I can offer the clarification. Let's talk about the acid catalyzed ring opening reactions. Um, for acid catalyzed ring opening reactions, if you have choose between tertiary and primary, if it's acid catalyzed only, um, you will have your nucleophile will attack at the tertiary carbon. But if it's secondary versus primary, you go based on the sterics. And this again is only has to do with acid catalyzed reactions. Because when you protonate that epoxide, you pull electron density away from those two carbons and make them more strongly partial positive. 
And the tertiary one is the one that is going to be easier to break that bond because it's closer to being a tertiary carbocation. Right, so in general, there's only one case where you go against what the sterics would dictate for these ring opening reactions. And that's if it's acid catalyzed and one of your carbons is tertiary. Other than that, just go with the less sterically hindered side is going to get the nucleophile attached. But in this specific case, acid catalyzed with one side being tertiary, you put your nucleophile on the tertiary carbon. Um, so that is going to be, so I will go back and make sure everybody gets their half a point back if you put the brom bromine on the wrong side, because I missed that when I was writing the question or when I was grading them anyway. Maybe I, maybe I remembered it when I was writing the question, but that was last week and who remembers that far back? Um, making thiols, switching gears back to thiols, making thiols is actually pretty easy. It's just like generating alcohols. Um, the easiest way is if you use a SH ion, also known as hydrosulfide ion, as a nucleophile. If you've got a good leaving group, you can go through an SN2 reaction and attach your, your thiol where the bromine or where your leaving group was attached. Um, it will go through SN2, so you do have that inversion of the stereochemistry where it flips around. Um, but it's no nothing we haven't seen before. We just, in fact, we've even used SH as a nucleophile before, right? I just, we just didn't talk about the fact that it was called a thiol, really. So if you want to know what you would start with to make each of the following thiols, you just replace the SH with, with the bromide. So for A, it only gets tricky when you have the stereochemistry to consider because you have to start with the opposite stereo center. So for C, if you started with the bromide pointed into the board, the sulfur is going to come in and displace the bromine. And it has to come from the opposite side as the bromine. So you get that inversion. And again, nothing we haven't seen before. This one's a little bit weird, and this one has biological applications. So this is worth thinking about. Um, thiols can be reversibly oxidized to produce disulfides. So a disulfide is when you have, is a lot like a peroxy bond. It's weaker than a peroxy bond and it doesn't split up in a way that gives you free radicals easily like a peroxy bond does. Um, but if you have two thiols next to each other, they will react if you're in slightly basic conditions. Uh, if we're doing this in, a, in a biological um, application, um, this actually happens under physiological conditions. If you put two thiols next to each other, they will react to make this disulfide bond. And so if you've taken a biochem class where they talked about disulfide bridges um, as part of a protein structure, that this is what's happening in that case. You're taking two, two thiols, letting them react to make a disulfide bond. Um, if we're doing this in a lab, it doesn't happen quite so easily. We actually need bromine as a catalyst. Um, but it just gives us a way to link two, sul two thiols together at the sulfur. Um, and this winds up make, being a big deal in, um, in physiological conditions because if you have 
um, I believe it's cysteine, is the amino acid that is a thiol. If you have two cysteine residues in a chain of amino acids, if they happen to fold so that the two cysteines put their two sulfurs next to each other, it will they will wind up reacting to basically it's it's a lot like folding a piece of cloth and then using a safety pin to hold it together. Um, and so it basically holds it pins the amino acid into the proper shape um, because of having those cysteine residues that attach things together. And I believe that's also um, how insulin is held together is with these disulfide bonds. Insulin is two different, um, yeah, insulin is two different, that's a good one, um, polypeptides, two different chains of amino acids. And they happen to be folded in such a way that the cysteine residues wind up being next to each other and forming these bridges that holds the whole thing together and keeps it folded into the right shape that your body can recognize it as being insulin. Um, so these disulfide bonds wind up playing a big role physiologic physiologically for a lot of reasons. And here's a, a good example for, from a pretty simple molecule. Um, well, by, by biochem standards, it's a simple molecule. Biochem standards is very, very complicated. Um, the other two reactions that, sulf that uh, thiols can go through is we can deprotonate thiol. And then we wind up with the thiolate ion. And so that's just like deprotonating an alcohol, except that thiols are better acids than alcohols are. So you can deprotonate it just with hydroxide. If you have a thiol and you expose it to hydroxide, you turn it to a thiolate ion. Um, and then that thiolate ion can then act as a nucleophile. And then, so this is actually going to be the formation of that disulfide bond. This is why the bromine is necessary, is because it actually winds up making an intermediate where we wind up with a sulfur bromine bond. But then another thiolate can come in and basically go through an SN2 reaction where it pushes the bromide off to make that sulfur sulfur single bond. Right, so it's a proton transfer and then two SN2 reactions gives you that whole mechanism. And it's a pretty, pretty straightforward process. You need the bromide if you're doing this in a lab. If you're doing this physiologically, if it's um, amino acids reacting together, you don't have this happening as much because there are a lot of other things around that can both deprotonate the sulfide and act as that sort of intermediate to give the sulfur something to attach to. All right, this is mostly review and we'll go over this at the beginning of lab today because I wanna to get to talking about dienes today. We're gonna to set up our next chapter. We're skipping a little bit ahead because we're not, skipping ahead we've just already covered the next two chapters because chapter 14 is infrared spectroscopy and mass spec which we've done those in lab and then chapter 15 is nmr which we've done in lab and are still doing in lab so we're skipping chapter 16 which is conjugated pi systems um, and so we're going to define what that means today um, and the most the simplest conjugated pi system um, is a diene. So a diene is two alkenes next to each other, di for two, ene for alkene. Um, and they fit into one of three categories, typically. Not typically, they have to be one of these. If you have a diene, it's gonna be one of these three categories. Um, the simplest is what we call an isolated, Diene and an isolated diene means that you have two carbon-carbon pi bonds 
but there's no resonance because there's some there's an sp3 carbon or an sp3 atom in between them which means you can't have any resonance happening um and so that's why they're considered isolated is because they're just not um able to go through that resonance if they can go through resonance they're what is known as conjugated. A conjugated diene means that your two pi bonds are only have one sigma bond in between them so that they can wind up going through various resonance structures. You can share those electrons over that entire area, similar to a benzene ring. And then the last category is less common because it's pretty unstable, um, but you can have what are called cumulated dienes also known as allenes. Um, those are not gonna have any resonance either. Because remember, when we were talking about resonance structures, every atom can only contribute at most one pair of electrons to a resonance structure, right? So this middle carbon that has two pi bonds, it's part of two different pi bonds. They can't resonate with each other because those two pi bonds are perpendicular. They can't overlap because by the definition of those orbitals means that those pi bonds have to be in a state where they can't overlap at all. Right, so cumulated, conjugated, isolated dienes, the one we care the most about, the ones that don't just act like regular alkenes are these conjugated. These conjugated ones where we have those two pi bonds can be lined up in a way that you share electron density across the entire system. So the one of the ways we can review how resonance is going to work is by looking at at these diene or triene systems and identifying which pi bonds are going to be conjugated with each other, which pi bonds can resonate with each other. Um, and that also goes into if we have any lone pairs that might be participating, figuring out if we have lone pairs that are isolated or that are localized or delocalized. So if we're looking at a, which part of the molecule is going to be conjugated, which is isolated? Where are the electrons delocalized? Are all of them, the pi bonds delocalized? Or are some of them isolated? I want to say the carboxylic at the top is isolated, but maybe the bottom part could resonate. Yeah, the bottom part can all resonate. All the pi bonds can resonate because there are no sp3 carbons in between. But this top system is separated by an sp3 carbon, which means the top carboxylic acid cannot resonate. You're absolutely right. So we'd say that the bottom pi bonds are conjugated and the top pi bond is isolated. How about for B? Got it. Again, a conjugated section and an isolated system. The pi bonds that are separated by a sp3 carbon cannot resonate, and so they're isolated.
So for each of these, there's a pi bond that is isolated and several pi bonds that are conjugated. And it turns out those conjugated pi systems behave differently. Um, one of the the ways we can we can make these conjugated dienes. Um, conjugated dienes are actually going to be easier to make than um, isolated dienes because it having more resonance is almost always more stable than less resonance. And so if you try to make an isolated diene, it, it will actually wind up preferentially rearranging itself to make a conjugated diene in most cases. Um, and so the way we make these dienes is gonna be very similar to the way we made acetylenes or the alkynes. We need to make two pi bonds. We have to do it in a way so that you don't put the two pi bonds on the same carbons. So we don't want an alkyne. And so the way we do that is we use a sterically hindered base. Um, so there it will go through, if you have a di, a di halide, if you go use a sterically hindered base, it's gonna pull away the hydrogens from the primary carbons which means you're going to wind up with your two pi bonds being further apart from each other. If we did this with sodium amide, we'd be turning it into butyne. But by using TBOK, we turn it into a conjugated diene. Right? And this allylic halide, that's going to be our intermediate after one step in the double elimination, right? After it goes through one elimination, it looks like this allylic halide. And then if it goes through another elimination, we get our conjugated diene. <laughs> um, I don't have a good example of a cumulated compound. Um, carbon dioxide is cumulated pi bonds, but it's not a diene. Um, it's carbon dioxide is gonna have this, that same similar shape. when it comes to the shape of the pi bonds, but it's gonna be an oxygen at each end. Um, but that's the only real common compound that has two pi bonds on the same carbon in going in different directions. All right, and so if we wanted, if we wanna look at some of the properties of these dienes, um, we can start by looking at why are these conjugated dienes more stable than isolated? So if we took, if we had two different hydrogenation reactions happen, if we fully hydrogenated, um, this would be known as 1,3-butadiene. So, diene is just, we're using diene instead of just ene as the suffix. And we say where each of the double bonds is. 1,3-butadiene gets hydrogenate, hydrogenated versus 1-butene. Um, and we have to do it twice in order for the, for the stereo, or for the uh, stoichiometry to work out. Um, but if we would expect that if there was nothing else going on, that hydrogenating a diene should be the same as hydrogenating two alkenes, that the change in energy should be the same. But we actually see that the 1,3-butadiene is about 15 kilojoules per mole more stable than isolated pi bonds. Any guesses why? Not really a guess because I said the answer a few slides ago. Resonance, right? Resonance. The more we can spread these these electrons out, the more stable they get. Um, and so 
we have to have resonance for that to happen, which means we need the pi bonds to be pointed the right direction, in other words. And so for these pi bonds to be pointed the same direction, that means this entire molecule has to be planar. In other words, we don't, we would expect the sp3 carbons to be planar, the pi bonds to be flat relative to each other. But the fact that we need resonance to happen means the entire molecule has to be pl planar. Um, and so that leads to really only two stable conformers. Um, you can have what's known as the S cis and the S trans conformer of, of these conjugated dienes. Um, because in order for them to be able to have this resonance where your pi bonds are all overlapping with each other, the whole molecule has to be flat. Um, and so that means that even though normally we would expect that we could have free rotation around this pi or this sigma bond, usually sigma bonds we think of as being able to rotate whichever way they want, right? That's not the case when we have conjugation. When we have conjugation happening, the whole thing has to be flat in order for it to be conjugated. Um, and so that leads to the fact that you can have a stable conformer where there, where your two pi bonds are facing the same direction versus having them pointed opposite direction. So we're, the name for these is S cis and S trans because we're not talking about the alkene group being cis versus trans. We're actually talking about the sigma bond being cis and trans. Normally, we don't care about sigma bonds being cis versus trans because they rotate around however they want. But in this case, they wind up being um, locked into conformers the same way that cyclohexane could be locked into a boat conformer versus a chair conformer because of the sterics. Here, it's not sterics. But we wind up with one, with these planar conformers being more stable than they would otherwise be. So which of these would we expect to be more stable relative to each other? If we had to pick which of these you know, 90% of the time we're going to find it in one of these forms or the other. Which of them are we going to be more likely to find it in? I guess the trans. And why? Just because of sterics. Maybe things are slightly more spread out. Exactly. Yeah, the S, the S trans is slightly more stable. Um, and we can actually calculate what these energies look like. When you take the S cis and you rotate around that, that sigma bond, you have to put in about 15 kilojoules per mole to get it to rotate. There's a transition state barrier of 15 kilojoules per mole, which should kind of make sense because we were 15 kilojoules per mole more stable than having isolated dienes, right? So we get about 15 kilojoules per mole of stabilization by having this resonance. And we have to break that completely in order for it to rotate from the S cis to the S trans. And then when we do that, we wind up finding that the S trans is about 12 kilojoules per mole more stable, and that's just based on sterics. And so if we compare that to, if we looked at one butene, that's our potential energy surface on the right-hand side. If, if we rotate the same bond with one butene, we wind up with much smaller changes. It's not 15 kilojoules per mole to break the resonance. It's only, there is no resonance. And so only looking at sterics, we would expect it to be about, about two kilojoules per mole um, 
more stable if you are in the staggered conformer versus the eclipsed conformer. But we're dealing with much larger energies if we have this conjugated system. Right. And that's because of the more stable, um, more stable compound that we get from the resonance. All right. We're going to start needing to talk about orbitals more before we can get into our next section of this chapter. So this is going to not make much sense. We're going to cover it again on Thursday. And hopefully after we've covered it a little, a fair bit, it'll start to make more sense. Um, so when we had atomic orbitals overlapping, that's how we got covalent bonds happening, right? When we could bring these orbitals close together so that pair of electrons could be in both of these orbitals at the same time so that they overlapped. That's how we got a sigma bond. That's how we get covalent bonds in general. But the thing about bonding orbitals is that you, these electrons also have a phase. And that's not like saying that the charge is different. And it's not even like saying that the spin is different. The orbitals themselves have a positive and a negative section. It's not related to the charge, but it is related to constructive and destructive interference. So constructive interference is when we have these orbitals overlap and they both can be facing the same direction and we wind up with a higher level of electron density in the area where we had both of these things happening at the same time. But if you can have constructive interference, if you can have these wave functions overlapping with each other in a way so that they can, the waves can get bigger, you can have destructive interference where you wind up with the orbitals canceling each other out. And so that's what's known as an out of phase interaction. If you have a wave that's going up and a wave that's uh, hitting a wave that's going pointing downward, they wind up canceling each other out, right? And so that destructive interference um, in atomic orbitals, and when we're talking about these covalent bonds, is known as an anti-bonding orbital. So a bonding orbital is what you get when you have constructive interference between the two wave functions, between the two orbitals. But if you flip the sign on one of those orbitals, you wind up with destructive interference happening, and that's what an anti-bonding orbital is. And so instead of getting something that's more stable, when you bring these orbitals up next to each other, you get something that's less stable. <coughs> and a lot of time, the shorthand that we'll use for these, um, if we have a pi bond, we'll just, we, or a pi orbital, you could just write the letter pi. A pi anti-bonding orbital, anti-bonding is a long word. We don't want to write that all the time. So we just call it a pi star letter pi with an asterisk. And so these anti-bonding orbitals wind up being something that, OK, mathematically, we can predict that they should exist. Why would we care, though? Because we're mostly going to be interested in the less and the more stable state, right? The more stable bonds are what allow things to actually bond together. So why? Why does it matter? Um, we see this a lot, and this is this is one of the reasons wh why we get um, why conjugated pi systems tend to absorb light in the visible spectrum. If you want, if you're looking at an organic dye, a carbon-based dye molecule. It's almost always going to be a bunch of conjugated pi bonds because that brings these pi bonds and antibonding orbitals close enough in energy that visible light can excite an electron from one from one orbital to the other. And therefore they absorb light in the visible region. Um, and so that's 
we see this with sigma bonds, but it matters more in pi bonds typically because sigma bonds are so strong that you're, the difference in energy between between the pi and the and the pi star winds up being a difference in energy that we can actually get to. Sigma to sigma star is such a big jump in energy that it's really, really hard to break that bond. And so we wind up with the with the sigma star, the sigma antibonding orbitals don't matter as much. And if we have a conjugated pi system, we can make those differences in energy even closer together. And so if we think about these, these p orbitals, these pi bonds as just being unhybridized p orbitals, there's actually more than just two ways we could arrange them. If we remember a p orbital is going to have this figure eight shape where one side is one phase and the other side is the opposite phase. Right? And again, it doesn't have to do with the charge. And it's not like you're more likely to find an electron on one side versus the other. It's like on a wave on um, in water. A wave in water that's moving through the surface of water, you can have equal probability at any point is the wave going to be phase up or phase down. Right. And so that's what these red and the and the blue colors are representing is basically like up versus down but we can't show it just as up versus down because we're working in three dimensions already. So we use color as a fourth dimension to kind of give us a way of judging what the phase is. Is it phase up or phase down? And again, that's different than spin up and spin down. Quantum gets really weird. It's why people that, that uh, subscribe to, to uh, string th theory say things like, well, there's 11 different dimensions. Well, because they just add a dimension every time there's a new variable that we don't have a way to spatially recognize. So color is another dimension, basically, that we're adding here to indicate the phase of these orbitals. Um, and if we look at these phase, the phases of these orbitals, there are four different ways they can be arranged. You could have them all pointed the same way so that you have a lot of, of constructive interference. Um, and that's gonna be your most stable state. Your most stable state is gonna have all of these pi bond orbitals, these p orbitals, all pointed the same direction. But the thing is, if we have to put four electrons, two pairs of electrons into this system, we can't put them all into the most stable state. The most stable state can only fit two electrons in it. So then we need another state that still has all the orbitals facing the same way that can is going to still be stable enough that we could put electrons in it. And so then what we do is we say, OK, well, what if we took half of these orbitals and we flip them the other direction. We still get a lot of good overlap. We just don't have overlap over the entire molecule. But we still have a lot of good overlap between these pi electrons. And so doing that adds what's called a node in between. Oops. I wanted the eraser, not to clear it. Um, the node is basically a place where you flip the sign, where the phase is going to flip between the two orbitals. And if the phase is flipping, so that's like a point where on our, on our wave in water, the node is the place where it's flipping from positive to negative, where it's flipping from up to down. Um, and if you remember learning learning quantum with me and, um, and doing the, um, where I brought in electric guitar and we talked about nodes, a node is a place where no vibration happens on a, on a guitar string. 
And so that's basically what we're introducing by flipping half of these orbitals is we're introducing a single node in the middle of the guitar string, in the middle of the molecule. We had our phase up on the on the left hand side, phase up was towards the top. On the right hand side, phase up is towards the bottom. And in between those two states, there's a point where, it, where there is no electron density. If we needed to add more electrons, there are two other ways we could do this. We added one node in order to make it. Um, make room for all four of our electrons. If we added two nodes, we have a state that doesn't have any electrons in it right now, but it still has some amount of overlap. The more overlap you have between these orbitals, the more stable they are, which means the more nodes that you have, the less stable it is. Right? And so the, the highest energy state would be if we flipped if we had three nodes between four p orbitals, that would be flipping the sign every single orbital. So there's no overlap between them. So this would be less stable than not having pi bond at all. And the reason we're spending so much, yeah, Adam, so does that mean that there's no space where there's an unlikelihood of an electron in that, in that case? There's like no, like um, I, isn't that, or did I say that correctly? <laughs> so for, for the, the least stable state, there are three places where you will, are guaranteed to not find an electron. Right, and the, what about the, the most stable with no nodes at all? Would that be 100% everywhere or? Or... Essentially, so each of these p orbitals has in within itself has a node in between the positive and the negative within the same orbital. So there's still you're not going to find any electrons right in the middle, which makes sense because that's where our sigma bonds were, right? And the whole point of a pi bond is that it goes around the sigma bonds that are already there. Right, yeah. And I had asked earlier in the year about like the nodes of sigma bonds too. So that's why I'm kind of following up on this question. So I yeah, see so, now. Yeah, good. Thank you. No problem. And this is why we spend time talking about this stuff back in Gen Chem when it didn't make any sense and didn't seem like it had any practical application is so that it makes more sense now because it does have practical application when we get to um, these dienes. We can predict the stereochemistry of certain reactions based on what the pi star orbital looks like. Um, and so the, this is our second lecture in a row where we get to talk about a fairly recent Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, the, what are known as the Frontier orbitals are also called the HOMO and the LUMO, um, which stand for highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So the highest occupied molecular orbital is the highest energy electron that has electrons in it. Sorry, the highest energy orbital that has electrons in it. So it's a lot like valence. If we're talking about atomic orbitals, we'd be calling that the valence shell. When we're talking about molecular orbitals, all of this hybridization and mixing of orbitals together means that it's not just talking about valence shells. We talk about the HOMO instead. So for this state, the highest occupied molecular orbital would be the state that has two no or has one node in it. And the LUMO. would be the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And that's gonna be the state that has two nodes. And the difference in energy between these two states determines what wavelength of light this compound is going to absorb. Because it can't absorb light 
that is a, a longer wavelength that has less energy than this jump from the HOMO to the LUMO. So this is actually how, how um, organic LEDs work, like OLED TVs. They have different compounds in the TV that have a different gap in between the HOMO and the LUMO. And the, the energy of that gap dictates what wavelength of light is given off when you excite an electron and let it fall back down. So by tweaking this gap, in, this energy gap, we can tweak what color is given off when we excite it using electricity. So that's how organic LED TVs work. And the reason that they're getting so cheap is because we're just using organic dyes, basically, in these little tiny pixels. And each of those organic dyes is going to have its own wavelength of light that it gives off when excited. Um, and so the, the HOMO and the LUMO are what are known as the frontier orbitals because they're right at the edge. There's, if you think of what frontier really means, it was where, where wilderness was meeting with civilization historically, right? And that's oversimplifying and negating the fact that, you know, Native Americans had their own civilization. We were ignoring that when we used the term frontier to say, well, there's the wild part and then there's the civilized part. And in between the two is the frontier. Frontier orbitals is right where you go from occupied orbitals to unoccupied orbitals. And that diff, that where it switches over from occupied to unoccupied is the frontier. Um, and as long as we're talking about Nobel Prizes, Kenichi Fukui won the 1981 Nobel Prize in chemistry um, for this idea that really the idea of frontier orbitals was really kind of scoffed at. He did the research back in 1952. Um, Fukui was doing the actual research and first published papers using the term frontier orbitals. Um, but it wasn't until a couple of white dudes from Europe um, did the confirmed his research that he was actually given a Nobel Prize for it. Um, and he had to share it with those two guys that confirmed what he had already postulated 30 years earlier. Um, they did the research 10 years. They only had to wait 10 years for their Nobel Prize um, that they shared with Fukui. Um, but because not that much respected chemistry was happening in Japan, and because the Western world really didn't like Japan following World War II, and you know, the, if you've, if you've, if you want to see an interesting take on on that whole situation, you can watch the the um, episode of Mad Men where they start talking about dealing business with Honda, and they're just just flagrantly racist towards the Japanese um, in that episode. And that's kind of what was happening in the Nobel Prize Committee at that point. That like, well, yeah. So what if he did good research? I'm not giving the Nobel Prize to that guy um, because he's from Japan. Um, so. Eventually, though, enough people that remembered World War II died off, and um, he actually did get his Nobel Prize, but not until after um, it, it had been confirmed by um, people that were from the more respected parts of the world. All right. So last two slides here. We've done addition reactions electrophilic addition reactions with HBr. That was the, one of the first reactions we did this quarter, right? Was if you have an alkene and you expose it to HBr, you wind up breaking a pi bond and adding a hydrogen to one side of the pi bond and a bromine to the other. So what products would we get if it's a conjugated diene? Uh, secondary bromines. So we're going to get, we're going to add a secondary bromine. So that if we ignore the conjugated part, if we just say, okay, I'm going to just treat this like it's an alkene, we would get an intermediate that would look like we add a hydrogen to one side, which leaves a, 
open spot on the other, we get a intermediate that looks like this, right? And then if, we, if we're just treating it like it was a regular alkene, we would just have the bromine come in here and attach. And we would wind up making a secondary bromide that is in the allylic position, right? It's on that second carbon there. Is that the only product we're gonna get? No, because of resonance, right? Because resonance, we could have a resonance structure that, that could happen. And if our resonance structure happens, if we move these pi, pi electrons over, remember to use our resonance arrows, not a reaction arrow. We wind up with an intermediate that looks like this. And that resonance structure gives us a primary bromide. So, which of these would we expect to happen more? Maybe the primary. Why do you say that? Just because it's backwards from what we would originally expect? Or why would I be bringing it up if it wasn't the primary? I don't know. It just seems like resonance would happen faster because it's closer than the bromine floating around. OK. So remember when we first covered elimination reactions and we were deciding if we were if we were trying to decide which alkene we were going to make in a in a elimination reaction, we used Zaitsev's rule, right? And Zaitsev's rule was the one that said that you're always going to, that the more stable alkene is the more substituted alkene. And so we actually do wind up making more of the primary bromide because that makes the more stable final product. Because this gives us a, a, a alkene that has two carbons attached to it versus an alkene that only has one carbon attached to it. And we could do something similar with this reaction. Um, I'm going to skip this for a second, just to get to that idea of thermodynamic versus kinetic control. Um, so they refer to these as the 1-2 adduct versus the 1-4 adduct. The 1-2 adduct means that you're adding the hydrogen and the bromine are at being added on adjacent carbons. And the 1-4 adduct means that you're adding your hydrogen on, if you say you're adding your hydrogen on carbon one, your bromide goes on carbon four. If we do this at zero Celsius, we can favor the one, two adduct. Because if we do this at zero Celsius, most we're going to favor the kinetic product. Meaning we're gonna favor the product that has a lower barrier because it's, it's gonna be the one that's made faster because most of your molecules don't have enough energy to make it over that barrier. So whatever the lower barrier is, is going to matter more if you're at low temperatures. If you're at high temperatures, then everything has enough energy to go over all of the barriers. So if at high temperatures, you're going to get the, the product that's favored by equilibrium, not by kinetics. The product favored at equilibrium is the one that's the most stable product. It has nothing to do with the, what the transition state barriers are. And so we get a complicated looking um, potential energy surface like this, where the red line favors is the 1-4 adduct. It's a higher barrier, 
but it's also making the more stable product. So it's slower to make the more stable product, but if you give it enough time and let it get to equilibrium, if you do it at, with a, at a high enough temperature that everything can move back and forth at will, you're going to make the most stable product. So high temperatures favor the thermodynamic product. Low temperatures favor the kinetic product because at low temperatures, it matters more about what is this jump to get between um, the transition states. So even though we're making a product that's less stable in the one, two adduct, because it's not as substituted of an alkene, we're, that's still going to be our major product because our barrier is less. And we will go through that again on uh, in class on Thursday. Casey? Yeah, sure. I was going to ask, what is the 1-2 addict versus 1-4 addict, like the name mean? So the one two adduct means that your addition reaction is happening on adjacent carbons. So carbon one and carbon two. A one four adduct means it's happening on carbons that are separated more. So if we call where the bromine ends up as carbon one and two, or sorry, So the one four adduct means you added your hydrogen on carbon four and your bromine on carbon one. The one two adduct means you're adding your hydrogen and your bromine on adjacent carbons. So the way that we would normally expect a addition reaction to happen. Does that make sense? All right, we will leave it there for now and we will do this at the beginning of class on Thursday and go through that same idea of, of thermodynamic versus kinetic control. Um, and it occurs to me that I don't have uh, your assignment. So you might be going over that partly in lab today because normally this is the time where we would do a lab on thermodynamic versus kinetic control. So um, you might be seeing that again later. And I will also, we will start lab by going through these practice problems, these review problems. Um, I'll, I'll put the um, solutions to these up and we'll go through them at the beginning of lab at one o'clock. All right, everybody have a good morning and I will see you at one. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Bye guys, thank you.